Excellent. Well, it's um, a huge pleasure to be able to welcome you all, so many of you, um, to uh, this year's uh, UCL Global Citizenship Lecture. And it's a huge pleasure also to be able to um, welcome today's speaker, Shami Chakrabarti. Um, our Vice Provost for International, uh, Dame Nicola Brewer, will be uh, introducing uh, Shami more properly um, in a moment. But I want to say something about global citizenship, and I, think, I hope you'll indulge me for a moment while I say a few words about this. Um, UCL is, as, as, as you ought to know, um, heir to a radical tradition, a tradition of thinking differently, of thinking radically, of educating, educating inclusively, regardless of gender or religious affiliation or class or ethnicity. And we are heirs to that tradition. And the way in which we try to articulate this today is through our, our commitment to an education for global citizenship. Now, what do we mean by this? Um, what we mean by this is we're trying to educate students who are not simply the best lawyers or, or engineers or historians. We're not uh, simply educating disciplinary experts, um, but rather we're educating students who see their connections to an ever more connected world in all its diversity and its inequality. We're educating students who are aware and prepared to act on their social and political responsibilities, i.e. radical students, students who are prepared to make a difference. And the main way that we do this is through our global citizenship uh, program. Um, this is a, a fantastic set of, of two-week courses that happen right after exams in June, but before the end of term. They're open to everybody. They're free for all, uh, all UCL students. And the idea is that through these courses, we help you develop um, the sort of insights, the sort of skills, the sort of modes of critical and radical thinking that are necessary to become a global citizen. Now, there is a, a purpose of this, which is to advertise the program. Registration is open now. Um, uh, students benefit and enjoy the program enormously. And I really would encourage you wholeheartedly to look at our website and, and ultimately to sign up and to be bold enough uh, to take part in what I think is, is, is a life-changing experience. Um, uh, as I say, uh, Nicola will be saying some more words about um, Shami in a moment. But I think Shami is. I'd like to include her as one of our, our, our global citizens. And I, I was reading her book um, the other day, and I found all sorts of statements about the responsibilities uh, that we have in a shrinking and interconnected world, about the importance of a sense of solidarity as well as self uh, 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 that we need in order to, 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 to exist as, uh, as citizens uh, uh, in a global community. Community. Um, and I think, I think more than that, I think Shami and her work embody exactly the sort of critical and radical spirit, the sort of courage, the sort of purpose, the sort of uh, ardent concern for justice, both at home and internationally, that we uh, want to promote in our education for global citizenship. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming, and thank you, Shami, for agreeing to speak. And Nicola, uh, please, uh, thank you for introducing Shami, too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> and, and in a sense, Tim has... Um, has done the introduction for me with all of those fabulous adjectives which apply to Shami Chakrabarti in spades. But let me have another go, because she's worth several in introductions. Um, and it's, it's a huge uh, pleasure to be able to introduce somebody who uh, the sun has called, you know what I'm going to say, Shami, uh, the most dangerous woman in Britain. I think that's, that's quite an accolade from that particular uh, source. But she's also, um, as anybody who hasn't been in hibernation for the last decade will know, she's also the director of Liberty, uh, the uh, Civil Liberties Advocacy Organization. And she's been that since September 2003. Uh, Shami joined Liberty the day before the 9-11 terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in uh, New York. Um, and I think one of the things that shows, apart from uh, her bravery, is that she has been absolutely the right person in the right place at the right time defending human rights uh, in, in Britain. Since I started with The Sun, let me, let me go on to a couple of other quotes about Shami Chakrabarti in the British media. The Times 
So the Times describes her, I like this one, but this is because I'm old enough to remember a particularly effective but very ancient lager advert. They describe her as probably the most effective public affairs lobbyist of the past 20 years, and that probably is British understatement. Um, uh, uh, the Observer has a slightly different phrase. They call her simply the undaunted freedom fighter, which I think is another fabulous uh, title. Um, and the Today programme, the Today programme in 2005, now remember that was only two years or less than two years after she'd become Director of Liberty, described her as one of the 10 people who may run Britain. Um, I, I like the way we use the modal verbs. I'm a linguist by background, so in such understated way in the British media. Um, Shami is also, of course, a brilliant advocate for... Well, actually, she's just a brilliant advocate full stop. But she's a brilliant advocate for the kind of... the sense of getting involved and making a positive difference in the world. So when Tim asked me to be involved in UCL's Global Citizenship Programme, this year and to be involved in launching it in February, Shami was the first person I, I thought of. She is an incredibly inspiring and scarily articulate speaker, as you are about to find out. Um, but before I invite um, Shami onto this uh, little stage, I'd like to add two things about her that not everybody knows. The first is that she's an absolutely wonderful friend, and the second is that she's got a very infectious sense of humor. So a couple of years ago, I was in uh, Cape Town, and I invited Shami, who was over for a tour by um, the Middle Temple, to help support uh, the independence of the judiciary in, in South Africa. And for a reason I can't now remember, I decided the one thing I had to show her was a troop, I don't know what the collective noun for penguins is, but not far out of C Cape Town, there's a, a troop of these very small, and rather undistinguished looking penguins. And I insisted on taking her to see it uh, on a beach in the pouring rain. And we laughed all afternoon. Shami, please come to the microphone. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nicola and, and Tim, for the, that wonderfully um, warm welcome. I have, um, I have been in this theatre um, sometimes before, um, over the last um, more than decade now, and sometimes in heated debate with various government securocrats, sometimes speaking alone, but it's, it's always been a, a very stimulating um, I I experience. Um, the reference to the most dangerous um, woman in Britain is, is really the, the gift that keeps on giving, um, um, thanks to News International, um, our sponsor this evening. No, no. Um, um, and, um, and of course, the closer you get, I, you know, I, I travel a lot around the country talking about liberty, talking about human rights. The closer you get to Liverpool, the warmer the welcome for anyone who's <laughs> described as, you know, the sun's nemesis. But, but just, but, 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 but it's probably worth just explaining just briefly um, how, how that happened, because I can see that you're quaking in your boots at the idea that this woman turns up, then 9-11 happens. She's the, she's the most dangerous woman in Britain. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a Jonah. But the, but, but the guy that called me um, the most dangerous woman in Britain in his column that he no longer has, um, is called John Gaunt, known to his fans and followers as Gaunty. And in addition to, to, to being a Sun columnist um, of some distinction for some years, he was what they call a shock jock on, um, on something called Talk Sport Radio. Your faces look really quite blank at this time. But when Nicola mentioned the Today programme, you were all over it. So, so, so you know, forgive my prejudice, you, you, you look like more of a Today programme audience than a Talk Sport radio audience. So Talk Sport Radio is, you know, what it sounds like. It's, you know, there's some talk and there's some sport and there's some talk about sport. And shock jocks are a phenomenon that, um, that developed in the United States um, where um, you have um, very lively, raucous um, presenters who do telephone, phone-in, current affairs programmes. And people phone in and talk about what they hate in the news that day and they have a, they have a 
Barney and a ding dong with the presenter. And it is actually quite important, lively debate. And some people, dare I say it for fear of being sacked like Emily Thornberry was, um, white van men, taxi drivers, people who don't necessarily always listen to the Today programme will listen to things like talk sport radio. And it is an important part of political discourse in this country. And Gaunty had a talent for it, and he was hired to, to be a shock jock in the American style, but very British, on, um, on his program on talk sport radio. And I would sometimes be in the, in, the, in the back of a London cab, and I would hear Gaunty, you know, arguing about how the country was going to the dogs and all sort of the metropolitan liberal elites' fault. That's me and you, or some of you. Um, and in particular, he had a jingle that he would play um, at periodic intervals in his program that went, shabby, shabby, shabby! <laughs> And I was once in the back of a cab, uh, you know, probably somewhere around here in central London, when that jingle was played. And I sort of, you know, did, did that. And the cab driver sort of looked at me and said, that's you, isn't it? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I, I don't know what you mean. My name is Rita, and I work for the BBC. <laughs> um, but, 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 but there was a serious side to Gaunty. I mean, he, he did, um, with others, you know, campaign for the Gurkhas, you know, because people can be contradictory in their views of rights and freedoms, you know. Even a stopped clock will tell the right time twice a day. Um, it's called the Daily Mail. Um, uh, the, the trick is to have your own watch in good working order so that you can, you can compare and you know what time it, what time it really is. But he, you know, he, he did write um, in favour of the, the Gurkhas being allowed to stay. But, but also... John Gaunt's story was he had been a looked-after child. He'd been in care in his youth, and he'd been uh, treated very badly. You will know that the state is not always the best parent. And he'd had a terrible time in care until his aunt had practically saved him and fostered him and, I think, eventually adopted him. But his dear aunt was a smoker. And one morning... Gaunty was debating with the leader of a particular local council that had decided that no smokers would ever be allowed, would ever be allowed to um, foster or adopt children in their area. And you can imagine that with his backstory that he had written about, Gaunty thought this was terribly unjust because there would be all these children in institutions that could be in loving families. So he's having this heated debate on the radio, not with Joe Public, but with a professional politician. Who, and, and Gordy says, but this is just so unfair because these little people, they need to be in loving families. They don't need to be in institutions. And the politician, I've heard the, I've heard the, the tapes and I've read the transcripts. The politician began to bait Gaunty and refer to his own backstory, which, of course, he had published. And um, it ends with... Towards the end of this, this exchange, Gaunty says, you know, what if, what if these potential parents promise that they will never smoke in front of the children. They will never smoke in the house. They will go to the step, as his aunt had done, and smoke at the end of the day on the front step. And the politician said, no, you, we can't do that. He said, I know some smokers. They're all liars. He said, I've got friends who are smokers. I've got colleagues that are smokers. They're all liars. We can't do that. And Gaunty said, but you can't say that. You can't say that everybody is a liar. I mean, that's just, that's just being a Nazi. I mean, I mean, a health Nazi. And the politician said, I've got you now. I've got you now. And Gaunty, he writes for The Sun and does talk sport radio and thinks that, you know, liberal values are a load of old nonsense that are bringing the country down. Suddenly he says, oh, I didn't mean it. I mean, I'm really sorry. And he apologises on air, but too late. Uh, a few complaints are organised to Ofcom. And very quickly, Gaunty is sacked. Right? No warning, no second chance, no trip to the headmaster's study, no, you know, nothing short of... He's, he's lost this, you know, significant part of his livelihood. And he went to see the Gurkha lawyers, a legal aid firm, of lawyers who generally do immigration work. Right? This is not what you'd expect from Gaunty. This is not where he thinks he would normally find his support and his salvation. And they tell him that, you know, the contract is pretty clear. He hasn't got much room for manoeuvre. However, there's this thing called the Human Rights Act. And Article 10 of the Convention on Human Rights, which you know is now given domestic effect in our Human Rights Act, creates the first freestanding right to freedom of expression that this country has ever had. 
by the way, there's nothing in Magna Carta about free expression. You've heard of her, haven't you? <laughs> in the great words of that uh, legal philosopher, Tony Hancock, remember Magna Carta, did she die in vain? <laughs> And, uh, and so he was advised that his best shot was, um, was to try and argue that his Article 10 rights to free expression had been abrogated by a combination of Ofcom and his employers and so on. And Liberty is an intervener in his case, which is currently pending in the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. This was the man who said that I was the most dangerous woman in Britain and that human rights was nonsense and madness. And I did have the delicious pleasure <laughs> of, of sitting with John, not on talk sport radio this time, but at the BBC with him saying, oh, you know, Magna Carta was for the toffs, but the Human Rights Act is for ordinary blokes like me. And that's the, you know, that's the story of the most dangerous woman in Britain and, and John Gaunt. But in a way, it's the story of my human rights journey over the last decade or so. In my experience, whatever you read in the papers and whatever you hear on the radio and whatever certain um, ruling elites, political elites and, and others say, everybody loves human rights. Their own. Right? And those are their friends and their family and people like them it's other people's rights and freedoms that are sometimes a little more challenging. And that is the nub of this little book that I wrote to some people's consternation because it's called On Liberty, and apparently that title was used before once. <laughs> How dare this kind of, dare this woman write On Liberty? Um, this is the, the sort of story of, the, of this book, and it's, it's sort of my story. It's a, you know, it's, it, it's a bit of a personal journey. It's a professional journey. It's the story of Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties, which is today 81 years old. And uh, when I completed the book, it was just about to turn 80 years old. And I, I'm, I'm to mention that because my colleagues will kill me if I don't tell you that if at the end of this talk you feel remotely moved to care about the defence of the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights, and you think you might be interested in joining Liberty, um, there is a benefactor who will give us £20 for every member that joins today. So I'm to, you know, I've done my bit now for, you know, that was the, you know, because you're worth it, because we're worth it, because your human rights matter, I'm to encourage you to at least think about that after this talk. So the book came out on the 2nd of October of last year, and the day after, the Lord Chancellor and Justice Secretary, Mr Grayling, announced his plans to scrap the Human Rights Act and replace it with a, quote, British Bill of Rights with common sense, end quote. And, uh, and so the book was perhaps timely, and everything that I uh, anticipated in the book has come to pass in terms of what the proposal is. So we now have at least two uh, uh, national political parties, the Conservatives and the uh, United Kingdom Independence Party, saying that they will scrap the Human Rights Act and, and possibly pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights. But to go back to the beginning, um, Liberty was formed uh, 81 years ago today in 1934. And you might think, 1934, 2015, surely these two dates can have nothing in common with each other. In 1934, there was really no TV, let alone reality TV or CCTV. In 1934... DNA had yet to be discovered, let alone taken from suspects and stockpiled on, in the biggest database uh, per capita anywhere in the world. Um, and yet, in 1934, um, certain newspapers that still exist in our public life today would regularly run headlines about how Britain was being invaded by refugees from Eastern Europe. That happened. It's the same papers, yeah. And in 1934, the particular trigger for the formation of the organisation that I've been caretaker of for the last 11 or so years is that hunger marches had come from the north of the country to assemble in London's Hyde Park 
and they were promptly duffed up by the Metropolitan Police. Sorry, that's a technical legal term for, for those of you that are non-lawyers and someone will explain to you. Uh, and what's more, the, the, the device that was used by the police was that, that some um, officers went undercover as hunger marches. They dressed as hunger marchers and deli behaved deliberately badly and violently in order to justify a violent policing response, agent provocateur. And you might think, well, some of you might think some things change, some things don't change enough. Others might think that would never happen today. And if you're in that latter, slightly naive category, lucky you. Um, the world looks very pretty from where you're sitting, but, but let me remind you of my friend Doreen Lawrence, who, of course, is now you know, the, the, the wonderful, the Baroness Lawrence of Clarendon, but, and after you know, doing something extraordinary with her life, which I can't even imagine. You know, I'm a professional campaigner who went to law school, and again, my story's in the book, but she, had, uh, she certainly had uh, greatness thrust upon her in, in the cruelest of circumstances. I can't imagine, as a parent, converting the agony of the untimely loss and murder of your child into becoming perhaps this country's greatest ever campaigner for race equality. But think about how the hits keep on coming for Doreen, and even in the last couple of years she's realised not only did the police not adequately investigate her son's murder, but they were actually investigating her and her family's campaign for justice instead, by way of undercover cops. Think about the women in the environmental movement that you've read about, I think, in recent years, who... Um, who thought that they were forming genuine, intimate relationships with men who they thought were part of their, their, their circle and their movement, who turned out to be undercover cops in relationships with them, sometimes fathering children for up to seven years, and look at the potential for the abuse of power in, the, you know, in any situation now as well as then. But it was the abuse of, of police power that led to a group of people far smaller than this generous audience meeting in February of 1934 in the crypt of St. Martin in the Fields Church in Trafalgar Square. I think you, you know it. The, the, the church, the old church opposite the National Portrait Gallery, there's a cafe still in the crypt. And a few of these people... A small number that, that they met and they wrote a letter. In those days, of course, no Twitter, no blogging, no Facebook. And so they have to write a letter by committee. Can you imagine? Um, and they wrote a letter to what was then called the Manchester Guardian newspaper, saying that they'd been disgusted by what they'd seen in the Hyde Park and something must be done. And they had that day formed the National Council for Civil Liberties to keep watch over the entire spirit of liberty in this country. I think that's an extraordinary thing to have done. The audacity of it, but the imagination of it. And that is why I asked people to join Liberty, because at our heart we're still a group of people who met in a room and decided to keep watch, and we keep watch still. And today we do it by a combination of campaigning and campaigning litigation and advice to members of the public and parliamentary lobbying, and, 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 that, and, and that's, what, that's what Liberty essentially is. But at its heart, it's a group of people who sit in a room and say something must be done. It's a membership organisation. And, and the people who signed that initial letter, you, of course, would never have heard of again, people like Clement Attlee and H.G. Uh, Wells and E.M. Forster and Vera Britton, and, which just goes to show that even the most eloquent people and great writers write really bad letters by committee. <laughs> And we have it. It's a, treasured, it's a treasured thing in our offices, and we have it framed on the wall, but the prose does not lift the, um, lift the heart, but the, but, but the values do. So that's a really, really important moment. That's our, in, our, in our founding myth and our, our history. But I think the next really important moment comes after World War II. This is essential, particularly in the context of global citizenship which in my view is not an aspiration, it's a reality. We just need to choose whether we're going to be good citizens or not. Or, or we could use a, another term for global citizens, um, human beings. <laughs> because, of course, citizenship in the, in the classic sense, as in I'm a citizen of this country, that is, um, that's a status of privilege that can be given or taken away from you by the political community, which in practice means the powerful. 
right? Those of you who know any history at all, um, you know, like you remember that Paul McCartney used to be in a band, for example. Yeah. Wings. <laughs> you know, aware, of, aware of things before your birth. I mean, you will know that there were Jews in Berlin in the early 1930s who thought that they were German above anything else. But they had, that, they had that taken away from them because citizenship is something that, as a privilege, can be stripped away from you. Humanity cannot. And it's in this post-war moment that we have the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and regional instruments like the now much maligned European Convention on Human Rights. And this, the, these, these instruments were not the, um, the creation of kind of 1960s hippies or you know, 19th century romantics. These are people who have lived through the Holocaust and the Blitz. And they've decided, these are people slightly to the right of the centre, people to the left of the centre, people from all over the world, people from all the great world faith communities and people with no religious conviction have all come together in this unique and yet to be repeated moment in human history and decided that there are certain core values that are essential for civilization anywhere and are essential if there's not to be another Holocaust, another world war. And, you know, lawyers can give you all the numbers and, 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 you know, take the joy out of the values, and sometimes that's required in a courtroom. I would sum up human rights values with three words. Dignity, equality, and fairness. Fairness as in, you know, fair trials and due process, as the Americans call it. Um, dignity that stems from the idea that each of us is precious just because we're alive, not because we're good or bad or British or French or American or taxpayers or aspiring taxpayers, but just because we're alive. That's every newly arrived asylum seeker and every newborn baby is entitled to their basic human dignity. Even people who've lost their self-respect and, and respect for others are entitled to a modicum of protection. That doesn't mean absolute protection against wrongdoing. Many of the rights and freedoms that we discuss in the book and in life are limited or qualified in order to protect other people, but you never lose your humanity or your human rights altogether. And that is a really fundamental difference between people who believe in human rights in the post-war world and people who don't. And you see it, for example, in debates about prisoner voting. Because right? whatever your views on prisoner voting, I say it's for people who want to deprive someone of the vote to articulate what is going to be achieved by this. It's not good enough to say they're bad people, they've lost their rights. But this idea that, you know, are rights privileges for citizens in one place or are they human rights that attach to all people everywhere? This is probably in my view, the existential question um, in, in civil society anywhere in the world today. And that's essentially what I argue in the book. And so those values, dignity, equality and fairness, as then dr you drill down into no torture, free speech, fair trials, respect for personal privacy, freedom of thought, conscience and religion. That's an interesting one the right to the faith of your choice, the right to no faith, and in my view, the most important aspect, the right to be a heretic in any faith community, freedom of association, and um, uh, the, the right to liberty, as in the right against arbitrary detention, you know, habeas corpus. People like it in Latin. Some, there's certain people in British politics who don't mind these things when they're in Latin, but when they're translated into English or into European languages, dare I say it, then it's, you know... Um, it's back to all that Magna Carta myth, you know. Yes, you do get some due process, the beginnings of some due process rights in Magna Carta, but not, a, not an awful lot else. But yes, habeas corpus, the, the right against arbitrary detention. But, you know, there is a, a right and freedom in the European Convention on Human Rights and in the Human Rights Act, which I say is the most important human right of all. Does anyone have an idea of what I mean? You see, when you do this with school kids, they're just like, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's too learned and, you know. Well, I think that the most important human right of all, certainly in the Human Rights Act and in the Convention, is equal treatment under the law. We lawyers sometimes call it non-discrimination or equal treatment. Humans call it empathy. Because, as I said, 
if we, um, if we really re cared about other people's children and other people's rights as we do about our own, there would be no torture and there would be no arbitrary detention, etc., etc. And uh, that is the sort of slightly um, philosophical or romantic way of putting it. But in practice, we have seen in the courts and in politics the way in which this principle of non-discrimination has really animated this... Um, this uh, occasional tension between political elites and the rule of law in recent years, and certainly since the war on terror. In the, in the book, I sort of try and trace a few themes of, um, of human rights debate and politics since 9-11, which, let's be clear, was a cataclysmic moment, and we knew that things were going to change. I think a lot of the authoritarian trends were already there, so let's not pretend that 9-11 suddenly produced ideas and instincts and tendencies that weren't already there. I have to give a great deal of credit here to, to two gentlemen who um, started a, an arms race in British politics in the mid-90s. One was um, that great liberal progressive Home Secretary, Michael Howard, um, and the other was, uh, was his young shadow. Um, now, what was his name? Um, Tony, um, <laughs> Tony Blair. And they went on to lead their parties and to move the home affairs stories onto the front pages of newspapers. And um, in my view, they, get, they have to get their credit for, um, for, for starting and continuing a, a very authoritarian arms race in British politics that hasn't really ended, hasn't really ended yet. But the three trends that I, that I note um, that were certainly accelerated post 9-11 are, first of all, the death of, the death of privacy, as a, not just the undermining of privacy as an individual human right, but as a societal value. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important to acknowledge that privacy cannot be an absolute. You know, to, to be um, a human rights person is to recognise that human beings are individuals but also social creatures. And the moment we come together in family units or in political units or in communities or in democratic society, we do have to give up a little bit of individualism and, and we have to rub along together. And there are therefore legitimate reasons for sometimes intruding on people's privacy. I have no problem at all with the idea that there has to sometimes be lawful, proportionate surveillance. If I suspect that someone is... Um, you know, is a criminal, and, and what they've done is quite a serious crime, or they might have contraband or a kidnapped victim in their homes, there should be a method of searching them, or of tapping their telephone, and so on. You know, all of these things can be used in a lawful and proportionate um, manner, in my view. However, where we've got to instead is, I think, a culture of blanket surveillance, where everyone is suspect. And because the technology has grown apace in this same period since 9-11, there is now this, this capacity as well as this instinct to turn everybody into a suspect, to scoop up everybody's data and then maybe sift it and weed it later on. And the argument, which perhaps you've heard, I've heard it so often, I, I can't tell you, um, the, the argument from successive Home Secretaries um, against me, I'm trying to be fair, Mrs May were there, for example, I sat next to her just last week, but you know, she might say something like, well, the innocent have nothing to fear from surveillance, right? Nothing to hide, nothing to fear from a more blanket approach to surveillance. Really? Well, tell that to the women in the environmental movement and tell that to Doreen Lawrence. And think about the way in which your privacy is also very important to your other rights and freedoms too. Could you have a fair trial, for example, do you think, without access to confidential legal counsel? How would you feel about your, your, you know, your health care and your, 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 your consultations with your doctor if you didn't feel that some of that information was, was, was protected? Um, could you really have a fair election without a secret ballot. We, we certainly think of a secret ballot as a paradigm of, of, of fair voting, don't we? And even though um, privacy is sometimes set in obvious tension with free expression, 
you know, particularly with the tabloids and kiss and tell stories. You know, somebody's private life is somebody else's kiss and tell story. That, that, that's true. Sometimes these two rights are in tension. Ask a journalist to give up their anonymous sources and they'll tell you where to get off. So sometimes these rights and freedoms are very closely related indeed. And I think deeper than that, you know, if you, if you, you do need, as I've suggested, you know, lawful proportionate surveillance, but, but a country or a society that, that has no value for, for privacy at all is a place without intimacy or dignity or trust between people. And uh, it's not a place where I particularly want to live. But I think this has been a real trend, perhaps one that we could have predicted post 9-11, and it's certainly been exacerbated by the rise of technology. And it's not just about governments and law enforcement and securocrats who do have big challenges, and no doubt about it. We can also be, you know, so there's the whole big brother idea, but we can also sometimes be very foolish little brothers and sisters to each other as well. And we're not always desperately smart in the way that we use social media. And I'm particularly concerned about perhaps a younger experimental generation. You know, it, it'll all come out in the wash eventually, but a lot of young lives could be blighted along the way because, of the, because we haven't caught up ethically or legally with the technology that allows for so much intrusion into, into our privacy. The second trend that I chart in the book is the denial of due process, as I call it, or fair trials, and the attempted shortcuts around traditional British justice, you know, the, the principle of the presumption of innocence in, 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 in criminal law, for example, the idea that you should be arrested on suspicion of criminality, charged when there's evidence, and convicted when there's proof. Right, that traditional model of how to deal with criminality has been seriously undermined um, in, in recent years, and particularly uh, post 9-11. And there's a, there are a number of devices for it, pretending that things are civil law instead of criminal law, pretending that things are immigration matters when they're really about ter terrorism. And in the book, I talk about people being interned, not just in Guantanamo, but in Belmarsh Prison post 9-11 and how when our law lord said that that was an unlawful interference with human rights, it was replaced with something called a control order, which is house arrest without police interview or charge or trial. Um, a, a device modelled on the ASBO, the antisocial behaviour order, which again was an attempt to, um, to get around the constraints of fair criminal trials in relation to low-level nuisance-type behaviour and was, you know, led to a number of young people in particular being criminalised, I think, in, in, in this country. And another part of this denial of due process and the importance of, of that kind of individual fairness before something bad happens to you is that we now have a plethora of secret court systems do you want to sue the state because you allege that you were uh, mistreated by you know, one of the security agencies? You will most likely now find that um, that civil suit is taken out of the ordinary courts into effectively a secret commission, sometimes where you and your lawyers will not know what's being said by the other side. They basically get to have a nice little private chat with the judge. And it's not fair... This... this um, this attempt almost to um, co-opt the judiciary into administrative secret processes is, is, is a particularly worrying trend, um, I think, since 9-11, since, since on both sides of the Atlantic, but we do it better than the Americans, as with so much. Um, and, of course, legal aid. But it's all very well talking about human rights principles, if you don't have access to advice and representation, then your human rights laws, like all your other laws, remain a, remain a dead letter in a sealed book. And I'm afraid that certainly in the civil sphere, in relation to all sorts of very important power relationships in people's lives, that is the reality in Britain today. It started under the new Labour government, and it's been practically finished off under the coalition. There are all sorts of people in this country who just will not get the advice and representation that they need um, when they're sometimes being deprived access to their children or facing deportation or the, the, or the loss of employment or, you know, unimaginable living conditions, etc., etc., etc. And that is not the Britain that I grew up in. 
where if you got run over, you would be scraped up by an ambulance and taken to the emergency room, of course. And if they check your, your purse or your wallet, it's to find out who your next of kin is, not to check your, your means or your health insurance. But it was also a country where if something serious was going to happen to you, you would get good legal advice and representation regardless of your means. That, I'm afraid, is no longer the case. Um, certainly not in the civil sphere and sometimes not in the criminal sphere either. Now, I suppose those things are predictable in the economic cer circumstances and post 9-11 and when fear stalks the land. Another predictable outcome of the war on terror. I do talk about euphemisms in the book. You see, when you do my job, there are certain adjectives you're never supposed to use because people stop taking you seriously. One is um, draconian. Another is Kafkaesque. <laughs> and, of course, the, the big no-no the big is Orwellian. Right, never, um, does it, do any women writers ever get adjectives named after them? Anyway... We'll work on that campaign later, right? But, yeah, so you, you're not to, to use words like Kafkaesque and Orwellian, but, but actually, for me, Orwellian doesn't mean, are there 15 CCTV cameras rather than 10 in the street? Orwellian, for me, is his great but, but not well-known enough essay, The Politics of the English Language, which describes beautifully how the, how the abuse of words can lead to the contortion of ideas and ultimately the abuse of people. And the war on terror had a lot of that going on, right? In fact, even the war on terror itself. You know, it's not to say that terrible atrocities didn't happen. They needed to be tackled. But a war against an abstract noun that describes political or ideological violence has always been part of the human experience. That's a war without end. That is uh, Mr. Rumsfeld's new normal. A permanent emergency is not an emergency anymore. It's a new way of living. But you've suspended the rules of the game, as uh, Mr. Blair infamously said. Other great war on terror euphemisms. Um, waterboarding was not a seaside sport. Extraordinary rendition was neither great war plastering nor beautiful singing. Um, I think an obvious trend to chart post 9-11 is the denigration of the other, British Muslims in particular, but, but, it also, but refugees in general got swept up into this. The denigration of the other is an, obvious, is an obvious trend when fear stalks the land, and that can be fear of terrorism, even in economic boom years, and now it's, it's, it's the fears that caused by economic turmoil by collapsing markets as well as collapsing towers. But, you know, a lot of this perhaps could have been predicted. Um, but the one thing I never would have predicted as a, as a young human rights lawyer who you know, has had the greatest privilege of, of doing this work, the one thing I never would have expected is that I would have had to make arguments in one of the oldest unbroken democracies on earth against torture in freedom's name. That one I did not see coming. Some of the others you could predict. Internment even, you know, blanket surveillance, a bit of racism and Islamophobia, really unfortunate, but predictable, but not torture. And there is a chapter in the book where I talk about the way in which even clever lawyers on both sides of the Atlantic began to make excuses for, create Byzantine ideas, ideas and processes to disguise that, that heart of darkness, which is the big absolute. We've talked about all these qualified rights and freedoms and how they sit in tension sometimes, and we need to, we need to look at how to protect them, how to protect minorities in particular by principles like non-discrimination, which force majorities to empathise with minorities, which allow the courts a role in working with the ballot box, but but torture is the, is the absolute no-no if you believe in human rights. And we have flirted on both sides of the Atlantic, more than flirted. We have been complicit in torture in freedom's name. And that is, I think, the, the heart of darkness in, in the book. But the, but the conclusion, to be more positive, is that if we do keep the empathy and if we do see ourselves as global citizens... We can empathise with people all over the world. And 
I think that multiple identity is, is, is not a sort of fancy sociological term. I think it's a human reality as well. I think that some of us in this room will identify as being of a similar age or some of us are lawyers or perhaps recovering lawyers or perhaps you never recover, you're just in remission, I don't know. <laughs> um, some of us, you know, are women or parents or Londoners or, you know, it's, it's okay to identify in different ways as long as you're choosing and as long as there's some flexibility so that you can have empathy with different people. The kind of identity politics that is desperately corrosive, in my view, is when somebody chooses for you. It's not the, uh, it's not the supermarket checkout where you decide what you'll have tonight. It's the uh, military checkpoint where someone decides for you. Often with a gun, often asking to see your papers, they tell you what your identity is. And there's a line, and you, which side are you going to end up on? And I think that a lot of the worst aspects of security policy, whether domestic or international, are about forcing people into these boxes too readily, like the war on terror, like enemies within, like forcing people to make a choice and, and removing the empathy and solidarity that they have with their neighbours, uh, or making them choose either their neighbours or people that they understandably identify one other on the other side of the world. And ultimately, if you want to protect people's rights and freedoms, which are essential, in my view, to, to protecting democracy itself, right? Because otherwise, today's popular leader or coalition can shut down human rights and become tomorrow's tyrant. You know, you don't have to be romantic about human rights. You can just be hard-edged and regulatory and say they are the rules of the game <coughs> that is democracy. But if we are going to preserve human rights for whatever reason, belief in human dignity or a belief that they are essentials for democracy, I believe both, I think that it comes back to this choice. Would you like to be protected by a small bundle of privileges that's afforded to you by the government of today in this tiny corner of the globe? Or do you seek the prote protection of being a human being everywhere? I know, I know which I find more comforting, and I know which I choose, and I hope you feel the same. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Shami, for that compelling and stark and heartening uh, lecture. Time for questions now. Um, so I'm going to throw that open to the audience. I'm going to suggest we group questions in groups of three, if you're okay with that, Shami. And so can I look for the first three questions? I can see two hands up over there. Let's start with those two. Thanks very much. Could you say your name? My name's Charlie. Thanks very much for your powerful words. Um, so given our purpose today of talking about human dignity and human rights um, and about UCL being a global citizen, um, would Shami or maybe you want to pass this over to the Vice Provost or Provost to explain UCL's continuing £21 million investment in fossil fuel companies like Shell, which are known human rights abuses? And the next? Who's next? This one up there. Oh, right. Hi, um, Aram Barra from the Global um, Executive MPA here at UCL. Um, it is now widely accepted that the prohibitionist approach to drugs, or rhetorically called the war on drugs, uh, has failed and has caused terrible human rights violations across the world, uh, from mass incarceration and racial discrimination in the US, which has brought ACLU to now publicly and, and very openly advocate for, for the legal regulation of cannabis, um, to, to the use of death penalty across Southeast Asia and in several countries in, in North Africa and the Middle East, uh, which recently called Human Rights Watch uh, to also advocate for, for a change in, in, in drug policy. What's your personal stand on, on, on that? Um, how, can, how can drug policy be reformed, um, and, and what should the UK try and do uh, within that debate? 
Is there a third question in that part of the room? Even or? from a woman, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> to be sort of slightly radical, because we're going to be radical. Let, let's stick with those two first, and then we'll come down here afterwards. Shall we? There is a woman there, though. Okay. Yeah. And there's a microphone there, too. It's the first time I've been talking into a microphone, because I'm terribly shy. But there's one thing you don't talk about. I agree on a lot with you, and that is there's a very strong trend of dishonesty in public. How do you explain that? That people walk up to you and, for example, they say to you, you married this person, or you married that person, or you lost because you didn't marry that person. And you just think, it's utter nonsense. But they do it, and they will keep going on about it. And there is that trend in society. Very ordinary people will do it to you, but quite learned lawyers will do it to you as well, and they will keep forcing it. And I often wonder why. Why do they do that? It's obviously against your right to life. It's, it's, it's against your right to privacy. It's against your right just living in the world as you are. But how do you explain the actual phenomenon? Right, so you, you pick really easy questions here at UCL. <laughs> don't you? Better go back to the LSE. Um, 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 so it's not, for, it's not for me to speak for UCL about, about the shell thing, but um, you know, it, it's, for, it's, it's for others to, to, to speak about all that. But this is really, this is really, difficult, this is really difficult stuff. Um, I don't know whether it's suggested that UCL is investing or that it's had donations or whatever it is, but, but um, I think it's a challenge, I would say, for all um, serious national and international civil society, let alone, that's artistic institutions, that's academic institutions, to navigate the territory of, uh, of, of ethical donations and investments. And I don't, you know, I'd like to say it's like completely easy. I don't, I don't think it's completely easy. And sometimes you are, you know, weighing up um, greater goods, lesser goods, lesser evil. So, but, but, and lucky me, I'm not, a, I'm not a provost or a, you know, university vice chancellor or the head of the Tate or et cetera, but, but, but I agree with you. But, but it's, it's important that, um, that, that Nusson Mashali, he asked the question, didn't he, that, that the people are constantly on it because when institutions completely lose their way and aren't transparent, that's a real problem because you can't even have the debate. You can't even stand up and ask the question that you did in an institution where things are not... Are transparent, but I don't know that you know the particular story that you're talking about, so it's not for me to speak. The war on drugs was the second point, and of course, like the you know these wars that people de declare are infinitely problematic, and the, and the gentleman was quite right that I think my friend Anthony Romero, who who runs the American Civil Liberties Union, and he started his job on 9/11, and um, he's been a real friend and ally. You know, we we always say that we have the real special relationship. And it's not, yeah, it's not based on you know on, on military might or or even history. It's, it's based on on values. And of course, he's Anthony Romero, and I'm Shami Chakrabarti, and we're not necessarily the most obvious candidates to be representing um, those two countries. But we think that we speak for the, you know for the values of lots of people in these two great democracies. He tells me, in the context of this new ACLU campaign, that there are currently more African. American men in prison than were previously enslaved in all the years of slavery. And he attributes that in large part to what began as President Nixon's war on drugs, where people get these incredibly lengthy sentences. And you know, you've watched the TV and the movies, you know, multiple life sentences, you know. 159 years. I should be so lucky to get 150. You know, even even Botox won't deliver that. And you know, that's 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 a medical miracle, not just a legal folly, in in, in my view. And I think you must, and therefore I must agree with you that that drugs policy has lost its way. But the worst thing about it is that it seems to be so difficult to have a proper political debate that's based on science and not on the authoritarian knee-jerk. Now, I'm not an expert on drugs or on drugs policy. I've had a few other things to deal with, you know, as I, as I talk about in my, my book. Um, 
um, particularly since the war on terror. But I, but I do think that there, you know, there was a period, um, maybe in the 70s, when there was an attempt in British legis legislative policy to, to, you know, to give more credence to experts to advise government on, you know, on, on which drugs should be licensed, in what context, and what the categorisation should be. An attempt, perhaps, at a more enlightened moment, and that seems to, you know, that seems to have have rode back. And you, you know, you've seen stories about the high-profile resignations of people on these various advisory councils, and so. On. So I think a good start would be to, you know, to give a little bit more credence to to the scientists and the experts who do study these drugs, rather than it just be uh, always knee-jerk politics, and that. I th oh no, there was a, a dishonesty in society. That was the hardest question of all, I think. And your experience is that people are very dishonest. Well, look. So people are asking you to get married for. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, I don't. I'm. 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 I'm not sure. I'm understanding the particular context. But what I will say, generally, is that I guess I do believe that, on balance, people are slightly better than not. I do. I do know that people do all sorts of terrible things, and there are all sorts of reasons for it. But I suppose, in the end, I am. I do this this work because I am a bit of an optimist. And I think with all the bad things that people do and all the challenges that the world faces, I do look at the history of our species and think we have done extraordinary things and are capable of doing yet more extraordinary things. And I think of that... Cause often, and I've got to say this because I, I go and do these talks and I've been doing it now for this work for a lot of years. And I remember once speaking... I think it was the University of Bristol and it was at the height of the war on terror. Maybe it was, I don't know, 2005 or six or seven or something. And I was talking about extraordinary rendition and identity cards and internment and, and this litany of, of pretty grim stuff. And at the end, a, a, a woman, a scientist actually, um, who I later saw on TV as one of these great sort of public intellectuals, came up to me quietly. She didn't embarrass me in the, in, in, in the auditorium, which was very kind of her, because I probably deserved to be embarrassed. She took me aside and she said, Jamie, I found your, your talk incredibly illuminating, and I learned so much about all these terrible things that are happening under our noses. But she said, do just remember one thing. And I said, what? And she said, Martin Luther King never said, I have a nightmare. <laughs> There were some more questions here. Can I just add a very brief coda um, to the question about, about fossil fuels? Because I agree with Shami. Um, UCL is and needs to remain a transparent organization. So we have set up a process, or rather the provost has, um, to look at uh, the investments that we have. I'm not part of the process, neither is he, but that will report and we will discuss it with the students who care about that. Please, there were some questions over... Gosh, they're all over the place now. Um, there's one here. And Two, three there. You might have to take four this time, Jamie. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sheila. Hi, I'm Sheila. Sheila. I just want to know, what do you think about the fact that we might have to pay to protest? Yeah. Mm, I just thank want to know, you. what do you think? Right. Okay. There was a group of questions over here. Uh, I saw at least two hands up now and a third one. Hi, um, I'm Mira. So, my question was... Um, <sighs> Arguably, privatisation is increasingly challenging the sovereignty of the state. How is this affecting um, our ability to hold the state accountable on human rights yeah. issues um, in the context of the UK, but also sort of internationally? Thank you. Question in, almost directly behind you, and then one in front of you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Katie. I'm a staff member here. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, I had a question that's kind of related to the question of culture and rights. Uh, in a previous life, I used to work on women's rights issues and specifically gender-based violence mm -hmm. and female genital mutilation and used to come across a very strongly put argument that this kind of um, campaigning for universal rights of, of women and girls and to mm -hmm. stop female gen genital mutilation was directly sort of challenging culture and, and, yeah. uh, and protecting culture. And I'd just like to hear your take on sure. that. Sure. You take one more. There was a gentleman just in front, blue shirt. I was going to ask a question about uh, privatisation and, 
and how that would relate. But uh, but someone's got but, yeah, yeah but else. okay. I, I I would say that the Human Rights Act and the ECHR are are a common sense framework for the legislative process and and for law and yet the political classes and the media are so against it. Why do you think that's the case? Right. Thank you. What Thank brilliant you. questions. Um, I should have said before that I wasn't just inviting um, questions. I'm quite comfortable with, with, um, with comments as well. You know. And my favourite are, of course, the, the comments that are thinly disguised as questions. <laughs> <laughs> and the best way to do that is to sort of lift your voice at the end of the sentence, as if you're, <laughs> you're French or Australian or, some, or, or something like that. Um, so, Sheila, uh, what do I think about the police charging um, people to protest? What do you think I think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, is that a rhetorical question, <laughs> Sheila? No, I'll tell you what I think about it. I think it's unlawful. I think they've done this with no, statutory, with no parliamentary debate, with no statutory authority. I think it's an interference with Article 10 and uh, Article 9 and 10 rights, and probably Article 14 as well, because why not chuck that in, right? And, um, and my colleague, uh, Liberty's legal director, James Welsh, is already advising certain groups who have been purportedly charged, because I say it's an unlawful charge, uh, purportedly charged in that way. If anybody else is part of a group that is facing that, um, that suggestion from the Metropolitan Police or any other police force, please get in touch with James Welsh at Liberty. He will thank me for it. No, he really will. Um, and, um, and we will, you know, take it, take it forward because it's, it's an absolute shocker. Again, no parliamentary debate, no statutory authority, just unilaterally, as far as I can tell, deciding that, uh, A, that they're going to start charging for core policing and, B, that you're going to pay for the privilege as opposed to the right of peaceful dissent. Um, no, we're not going to have that. Thank you very much. Um, but thank you for your question. Um, yes, you can. You make that. <laughs> it's, the, it's the little ripple that's. It's the little ripple that doesn't work. You may sit in stony silence, or you can. Cl it's that little ripple doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> so, um, mere privatisation as a, a challenge to to state sovereignty. Well. I think that, firstly, and then the gentleman mentioned privatisation too, in a domestic context, privatisation... I mean, I'm not going to get into socio-economic politics and, you know, you know, because I'm not a party... I'm, my job is not to be a party political person and, you know, I went to the LSE and therefore I know nothing about economics. <laughs> um, I did a law degree, you know. Um, but, but what I will say is when it comes to the rule of law... And when it comes to human rights, there are moments when privatisation can be a real challenge to actually both to democratic accountability and to the rule of law. I don't approve of private policing, whether it's in the context of the, of the protest piece or in general. I don't approve of coercive state power being privatised because that, to me, is a challenge for... That is a way of attempting to circumvent human rights, the rule of law, and even parliamentary uh, democracy and ministerial responsibility. So I've got a real problem. It's not for me to tell you that, you know, you shouldn't shop at this store or another store and we should all be, you know, wearing uniforms like the, in the old People's Republic of China. That's not the kind of argument I'm making, but I think I don't like private prisons, I don't like private policing, um, I don't, for obvious reasons. Look, look at, you know, Jimmy Mabenga, look at what happens when, you know, private security companies are doing deportation functions. I tell you what happens, people die. And ministers avoid accountability and responsibility because it was that firm over there. It was, so I've got a real problem with it at the domestic level from a democratic and human rights point of view. And of course at the international level, which is where the question sort of came from, it's also a challenge for democracy, accountability, and human rights as well. And this is yet another argument for the international human rights framework as opposed to having a British Bill of Rights and a French Declaration. And you know, Why should it be that internationalism is only for multinationals and for um, international terrorists and organised criminals... And, and even governments, when they choose to build super, you know, super governmental uh, organisations like the World Bank or whatever, why can't internationalism also be for human rights protection and ordinary people's values? 
That is, I think, a, a very powerful argument for global citizenship and, 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 and human rights as global governance, whatever, whatever you want, whatever language you, you want to use. And, and there are all sorts of, you know, I'm not qualified and I don't have time, but there are all sorts of attempts at circumventing um, domestic and international uh, legal norms by sort of contracting out at the domestic level, but also at the international level, and they must be resisted in my view. Um, Kate's question about sort of rel cultural relativism and rights and this sort of old chestnut that, that actually these aren't universal values, as I believe, at all, but sort of some sort of Western construct. You know, human rights is really a sort of Western construct, and it's an offence to people's you know, cultural difference to say that, you, you know, you, um, you shouldn't be able to effectively torture your daughters. Well, what can I tell you? The world is round or the world is flat. And uh, I believe that these are universal values. I believe they are practically innate. I don't believe that just greed and lust and envy are innate. I believe that people have the, the, the innate sense of fairness and justice. Nobody wants to be tortured, so they shouldn't torture other people. I think, you know, subject a classroom of children to collective punishment until they rat on their fellow classmates and they'll tell you that's not fair. And I think the real test is that, you know, I'm a human rights campaigner in Britain and I might get up certain people's noses and they might sort of say rude things about me in the, in the media. But in other countries, some of the countries where it's supposed to be a different cultural norm, people do my work at much greater personal cost. And they get arrested and they get dragged off and they get tortured by the security services. Don't tell them that this is a Western norm that they are fighting for. They are literally fighting for their lives. So what can I tell you? I, I, that's, it's a, for me, it's, a, it, it, it's an article of, of faith and belief and <coughs> logic that, um, that these rights and freedoms belong to, to everyone on Earth. They're just sometimes taken away. And then, um, sorry, I didn't catch your name. The, Anthony, um, why, if, if this makes such sense, why the hostility in, in parts of politics and the media to the, to the Human Rights Act and the, the European Convention on Human Rights? Well, I have a go in the, in, in the book, and I'm doing the shameless plug yet again. All the proceeds, by the way, go to, go to liberty, um, <laughs> not, to, not, to, not, to, not to me. Um, why the hostility? Well, for some people... It is this word European, which makes them think not that they are, we're talking about a human rights instrument that was drafted in, in no small part by English conservative lawyers after World War II. This is Churchill's legacy far more than it's Attlee's legacy. Churchill and his, um, and his, you know, conserv his government lawyers and, and his um, fellow conservatives were really concerned after World War II with, you know, defending sort of British type values as a bulwark against Bolshevism and Nazism and so on. But this word European is, is very complex at the moment. It's, you know, so it's, you know, a brat verse or it's, you know, or it's Silvio Berlusconi or it's driving on the wrong side of the road or to be more favourable, it's God bless Angela Merkel's handbag. That's a woman with a big responsibility and a big handbag. But you, you take my point, it gets, it gets in, intertwined with that whole Euro debate. That's part of the problem. And I think that there's all, there are also vested interests. You know, we have this wonderful fairy tale in this... I love fairy tales, but there is a beautiful fairy tale at the heart of our constitution called parliamentary sovereignty, which is often executive domination rather than parliamentary sovereignty. And certainly when you hear ministers and prime ministers saying, who are these judges? Who are these unelected judges that make me feel physically sick? Um, you know, and they talk about parliamentary sovereignty really as the challenge to the executive domination rather than you know, parliament itself. And that's, part, you know, that's a vested interest. And then, of course, parts of the media don't like the Human Rights Act because of Article 8, the right to respect for your private and family <coughs> life and your correspondence. And, phone hacking, Leveson, etc., etc., etc. They don't like all of that until it's a journalist and their sources. So, go figure. Um, Conscious, my watch is not uh, a Daily Mail one, and I haven't stopped it, but we are just about running out of time. Let's just take one final round of questions. So there's, there are two hands over that side of the room, and there are lots over this one, but there's one in the middle at the back, the gentleman in the uh, grey shirt. Two people over here. 
Um, thank you for the amazing speech. Oh, thank well, you for coming again. We I know, again and again. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I do because I admire you so much. But to get us really biographically up to date and topical, um, and then have another little question at the end. Why did you um, withdraw from going to the globe, speaking at the Global okay. Law Conference at Queen Elizabeth II? I mean, I know, but I'd just like you to say it. Yeah. And secondly... <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Well, because I was standing outside with a banner and expecting you to come and talk outside, and you didn't. So that's my way of expressing disappointment. Okay. Um, make, make your short your second question yeah, really short, please. Yeah, my second please. question, and perhaps more importantly, um, don't you think it's unfair, talking about fairness and universal values, in some countries, legitimate and illegitimate children both get inheritance right equally, but in this country... Um, illegitimate children have no right of inheritance and I'd like to say something about that and perhaps to promote that they should. Thank you. There was another hand over here. Um, the person at the back there, sorry, you're hiding that in, in a uh, striped shirt. And then if the other mic could be for the gentleman in the grey shirt. Yeah. Oh, hello Shami, my name's Catherine. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. I just wanted to pick up on your comment about the death of privacy and what your thoughts were on the care.data initiative. Thank you. And um, the gentleman over here. Hi, my name is Miles. I'm, I'm interested to know how you would evaluate the role of religions in protecting human rights. Yep. Thank you. Okay, that's probably okay. enough, isn't it? Three final questions. Thank you, Shami. Okay. So, um, Global Law Summit, um, I, some considerable time ago had been asked to go and participate in a, in a session on privacy and obviously it's something that I care about very much and so without, you know, in a heartbeat I said yes I'll come and debate privacy at this global law summit and then as time went on I realised that it was something that, um, that was being sort of that the government was sort of wrapping itself in and they were sort of using it as a sort of celebration of Magna Carta but actually months earlier than the actual you know and it just felt it felt apolitical and a PR job and it, it felt hypocritical to be wrapping yourself in Magna Carta and in Britain as an as it is a wonderful international centre for legal services and the rule of law at the same time as vowing to scrap the Human Rights Act and decimating legal aid. So at that point, when I saw that ministers were wrapping themselves in this thing, I decided I would rather not be part of that, thank you very much. And I might not have been outside the summit, but I was at the, um, at the comedy night in Islington last night, um, um, you know, doing the Tony Hancock joke and anyway, whatever. <laughs> the, the comedians were much funnier, but... Um, <laughs> But there you go. Um, and the next thing was oh, the, the, the rights of, of, of so-called illegitimate... I, I even hate the phrase illegitimate children. Yeah, you know, I know. And, and I'm obviously not an expert in, in, in the law of in, inheritance, but I think you're, you're clearly onto something. There, you know, there are clearly historical things going on that are probably yet to be properly reformed um, in, in property law in this country, and there are all sorts of technological advances that can help, including DNA and so on. But there are others, you know, there are family lawyers and, 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 um, and property lawyers who would be better placed to take that forward. But I certainly share your, your, your sentiment that there's no doubt many injustices there. And then there was, can I even Pri read my privacy handwriting? Question. Privacy question. Uh, data, yeah, uh, there are, I am generally concerned about over, broad, uh, over large databases and about, uh, about expecting people to opt out rather than opt into things. And I, I just have a, ge a general instinctive aversion to bigger and bigger haystacks in the context of surveillance, but also to, to over broad sensitive databases, even if, they are, uh, even if they are compiled for laudable reasons like the children's database that we defeated at one point. It was going to have so many exceptions for celebrities' children that you kind of thought, well, what about the children of ordinary people who've got abusive ex-partners? And, mm. you know, honey pots of sensitive data uh, are, are dangerous, uh, in my view. And then religion. Well, chapter six of the book <laughs> is called Rubbing, Rubbing Along Together. It's the final chapter before the conclusion. And... It's an attempt to deal with, you know, some of these tricky things like the relationship between 
religious freedom on the one hand and um, gender equality and gay equality on the other. And um, I haven't got time, but, but do have a look at it. But, but what I will say is this. Um, I don't think that um, religion is all dangerous, divisive mumbo-jumbo that is only the cause of crusades and, and, and wars and persecution any more than I think that science and engineering is always responsible for atom bombs and gas chambers, right? I think that, you know, religion can be a very bad motivation, but it has also motivated people to, um, to do great acts of, of altruism and, and kindness and art and, and humanity. And, 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 of course, science, you know, is, you know, is, is the same. I think that we are, as human beings, are creatures of faith and logic, emotion and reason. And to protect human beings and human rights is to is to is to be realistic about the uh, the human the the human condition. And the trick, the key to the human rights kingdom is is this point about equal treatment or even non hypocrisy. And so I think that we have to say there is no right not to be offended, um, and there must be free expression even when it offends whatever sensitivities, political or religious, but equally, free expression should include the right to dress um, in a way that expresses your religion. And I think that I'd like to see, you know, all over Europe, including in France and elsewhere, that, you know, freedom of conscience, but also freedom of expression expressed with a more even hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm sure there are some uh, unasked ones, but Shami, thank you for all of your answers. And I think we've now got Tim. Um, Shami, thank you for that extraordinary uh, uh, lecture and for engagement with all those questions. And I think, um, Shami, you, you made a really, really powerful and also um, uh, not incidentally um, funny uh, case for some very important things um, for empathy, for uh, concern with the rights of others, not just our own, for the importance of clawing back internationalism from the multinationals and the terrorists, which I quite liked, um, but for a sense of citizenship not as something that is limited, that is a privilege, that is exclusive with rights that can be taken away, but also um, for a sense of uh, uh, citizenship that is something that belongs to human beings, that has uh, basic human values of dignity, equality and fairness that can't be uh, taken away. Um, so as a result, uh, global citizenship, obviously, is what, what I meant to say. So I think Shami's persuaded us of three things. Um, one is that uh, we should see if we can make a blip in liberty's finances and we should join today and the £20 will be added. Um, the second is that we should sign up for the global citizenship program. <laughs> but you were going to do that anyway. And the third is that you should probably buy Shami's book, which I think yeah, is available pre-signed on the way out. Uh, but thank you so much for talking to us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.